Right, my name is Ben, uh, Ben Drew. I, wor I work in um, engineering, and uh, this is part of the mathematics module that will be taking the first year. Um, but it's looking very specifically at um, a piece of software called MATLAB. Okay, so what, the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the sort of introduction to this part of the course, and uh, then we're going to do sort of, you know, a little bit of a demo to show you what, um, what it's capable of, and then we're going to go through how you start get, get um, how you get started with with MATLAB. So, first off, I'll talk about how MATLAB is incorporated into en the engineering maths module. Okay, um, the schedule of uh, of the classes um, because it's a mixture of lectures and computer workshops. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about the course notes because there's some things that, that are worth knowing about them. Um, I'll talk about the assessment for this part of the course. What is MATLAB? Okay, just to give you an idea. Um, how to get help when you're using MATLAB, um, and, uh, and you know, if you've got any other questions. And like I said, a bit of a demo. Um, I'm just going to go through the notes um, that, so, you know, to give you an idea of how uh, it works. So, engineering maths is split into two parts okay, this year. Um, you've got your maths part. Okay, I think you all had a lecture today on, um, by Alison. Um, that's going to be the mathematics bit. Okay. Um, and that's going to go through all the theory and that sort of stuff. The other part is this bit, okay, which is MATLAB. Okay? And, uh, and so that's going to be given by me. It runs in the first semester only, my part. Okay? Um, and it's, like I said, it's a mix of lectures and computer lab workshops. Now, the way it's set up is that we've, we've got every three weeks, we're in week nine now. Okay? This is the academic year calendar. Um, this week is week nine. And week, tw week 20 is the last week of the semester before the Christmas break. And every three weeks, so 9, 12, 15, and 18, we've got a lecture in this room at this time. Okay? Um, there's four main topics, um, and they each align to one chapter in your book. Okay? So we're chapter 1, Introduction and Basic Concepts. The intervening weeks, so 10, 11, 13, 14, and so on, are going to be computer workshops. So next week, there is no lecture. Okay? Um, and, but you're, on your timetable, you should all have um, a workshop, and they'll be in computer labs. Okay? I know that some of you have a workshop at this time in 1N10 with me, okay? but there are some other staff also working on this as well. And so they'll, they'll be, uh, they'll be um, facilitating those workshops. And so that's the schedule. That's in, that's in your book, so you can refer to that if you're trying to work out which week we're on. Obviously, week commencing is what WC stands for there, okay? So that's the, that's the schedule of stuff. Like I said, four chapters. It's all relatively sort of, you know, we're starting from scratch, blank slate. If you've never used MATLAB before, it's not a problem because we're starting right at the very beginning. And we're getting up to actually making sort of programs, uh, which is what these two chapters are associated with. So making a specific program that performs a specific fun function. So that's the schedule. The course notes. So this is the notes that you've got. Okay. The course, the MATLAB bit that we're working on is going to be very self-contained. Okay. Everything you need to know is in the notes. Um, if you want to look further or you've got other questions and stuff, you can ask in the tutorial or the workshop sessions or you can ask in this lecture. I don't mind people sticking up their hands and stuff. Um, but you know, generally, it should be relatively self-contained. Like I said, one chapter is going to be one topic, and that, like I said, we last three weeks on that topic. There'll be a lecture followed by two tutorial sessions. At the end of each chapter, we've got a worksheet for you to go through. And what I sort of envisage you guys doing is, is you know, we'll go through the demo, like I said, in the lecture. Um, and then perhaps the first week in the workshop, you go through the, the actual chapter, trying things yourself, okay? So more or less perhaps repeating what we've covered in the lecture, perhaps you know, experimenting a bit more. And then the following week, you could perhaps have a really good go at those uh, worksheets. Um, there's a few conventions that I've followed in the notes. You'll notice in the notes, along the margins, there's some numbers. Okay, and you might be thinking, well, what numbers do they refer to? Well, you see right now, we're on slide number five. Okay, and if you look up five in your notes, this is what we're talking about. Okay, so the, the notes and the presentations link into each other. And so you, you should be able to follow the notes relatively easily as I'm going through them. 
that's for the presentation bit. Obviously, the MATLAB bit you're just going to have to follow by, um, you know, by watching. I've used different fonts for different things. If you see something written in the typewriter font, um, it's going to be a command that you can enter into MATLAB. Okay, so if you see something in the typewriter font, that's going to be a command, and um, you'll see when we get onto it that I, there's, I've put bits of code inside a box, and those boxes are going to have line numbers, and that's because in the text I refer to certain lines, lines of code. Okay, so that's what those numbers mean. <coughs> now I haven't got a slide for this, but you'll see on page uh, six there's a there's the teaching staff. So. There is my, e um, my name and my email address, okay? Um, and like I said, if you've got questions and they can't wait for the workshop or the lecture, then by all means email me, okay? And you'll see there there's the two other members of staff. We've got Jan. Um, he's in the maths department. He'll be doing some of the, the uh, workshops. And then we've got Gary, who's also a lecturer in engineering, and he's going to be doing some of the workshops as well, okay? So the assessment... Alison probably mentioned something about computer-based tests in the maths lecture, yeah? Okay, well, um, some of those questions on, that on those tests are going to be MATLAB-based questions, okay? <laughs> so it's quite useful um, for you to follow along and, uh, with, the, um, with, with the work, okay? Keep, keep up, because those questions will appear. And at the end of this semester, okay, actually in week 17, so just before the end of the semester, we're going to give out a piece of coursework that you have to complete, Okay. Um, what we're doing, to give you the time to do it, okay, we're going we're gonna to give it to you out in week 17, and you'll have then four weeks um, before the end of term, 17, 18, 19, and 20, okay? You'll have the Christmas break, and then you'll have the assessment period, and the work will be due back on the 31st of January, okay? And then we'll mark it and provide you. So you've got plenty of time, um, so that it doesn't need to, um, you know, you've got time for revision for your exams and those other things as well, but you've got plenty of time. Um, but those four weeks, I suggest you try and make a start with it because obviously you'll be able to get help from us in the workshops. Okay? MATLAB is on all the um, machines in the um, EDM computer labs. If you want your own version of MATLAB so that you can run on, at home on your own computer, um, the MathWorks, which is the company that makes MATLAB, do a student version. It's about £50 pounds, um, and uh, you can download it and install it on your computer. It's fully functional. There's no limitations, it's just, like I said, it's a student version, so you can't go out and use it for commercial use, but I doubt any of you at that level yet. One other thing to note about the lectures, some of you may have spotted that we've got Simon at the back, who's videoing the lecture. Um, and what, what we do with video lectures, what I've been doing with video lectures, um, throughout many of my courses, I've been taking them and posting them onto YouTube. And you can ac you'll be able to access the lecture through Blackboard. Okay, so it's, and it gives you the op opportunity um, to re revisit the lecture, go through things, perhaps the, if I've gone through too fast, that sort of stuff. Okay, and so you'll be able to um, rewatch this lecture. Um, it's not an excuse to not turn up because um, there are things that uh, that you get out of being present here um, that you won't get by just sitting passively watching the video. But it does give you the opportunity for a bit additional support and. Um, if you do happen to miss a lecture because you're ill or something, you're not put at a disadvantage. So, what is MATLAB? Well, MATLAB is one of the most popular packages of software that are used by engineers throughout industry. Okay. Um, before I got this job, I actually went for an interview with a company called Sterling Dynamics, and they're based in Clifton. And part of the interview was to solve a problem using MATLAB. Now, fortunately, I covered MATLAB when I was um, a student and, and during my PhD, and so I could at least have a, a go at this problem that, to solve. Um, obviously, you know, being a computer program, it's very good at things like repetitive tasks. Okay? If you've got a problem you want to solve, but lots of different variables you want to change, and it's the same problem over and over again, well, you can give it to MATLAB and it will just go through and do it for you. Okay? Saves you from having to do lots of repetitive tasks. And often you'll come across problems where, you know, it's the same calculation, but, you know, you need to do it many, many, many times. And again, this is, a, again, something that MATLAB is very good at. It's very flexible, very powerful. You can do all sorts of different things with MATLABs. Um, you can extend it with different toolboxes. We won't go into that here, 
but you know, say you're working on a specific uh, suspension system for a motor car, there's a special toolbox called Sim Mechanics that enables you to um, you know, look at simulation of, uh, of kinematic and uh, mechanical systems. <coughs> like I said, MATLAB is available in all the labs in the, um, in the Department of Engineering, Design and Mathematics. Okay? You probably won't find it on some of the public access machines, but all the labs within the department, MATLAB is on there. And when there's no class taking place in those labs, you can, of course, go in there and use um, the software um, if you want to. And like I said, there is a student version available um, to download from the MathWorks, and it's about £50. Pounds. Lastly, getting help. Like I said, the course is very much self-contained. I'm very welcome for you to ask me questions in both the lecture um, and the workshops. I understand if you're not particularly into doing it in the lecture, there's a lot of people, but that's fine. Um, you can wait until the end or, like I said, in the workshop. But also with MATLAB, like I said, it's very popular. If you just go to Google or Bing or whatever and just type in your question, often um, you'll get an answer to your question. So you can use the internet. And on the MathWorks website, there's full documentation as well. So if you want some formal guidance um, and find out what the exact you know, the, the stuff is, go to mathworks.com and you can get, the, uh, get, the, um, get some help. So... Let's get started, the demo. So I've got my lab open. OK, now let's close that down. This is, this is what the main screen in MATLAB looks like. Okay, And what I'm going to do, before we're going to go into the details of what's going on, I'm just going to give you a demonstration of the power of MATLAB. OK, so here I've got some, some files. Don't worry too much about what's going on at the moment, but I'm just going to run this file. Now, you've all heard of Bloodhound, yeah? The, the land speed record car. I've got a few graphs that have just popped up. And what this program does that I've just loaded up, OK, it gives us, here we've got the velocity profile in miles per hour versus the time in seconds. And the way I've set up um, the way, you know, the various parameters that I've entered means that I've actually reached 1,000 miles an hour. And I can change those parameters, run the thing again, so do all those same calculations again. So if I go back to this file, oops, where is it, that one? I can change the rocket start time Let's change that to, say, five seconds. OK, I can run the thing again. So it will do all the same calculations again. And I've got my new rocket profile. And you can see I've, I still reach 1,000 miles an hour, but it's slightly shifted this way. OK, so it took quite a lot of calculations, because this is, this is not only taking into account drag at the, um, at the lower speed, but it's also you know, drag at the near uh, Mach 1, which is... Um, which is transonic and it becomes very ugly. Um, it's not nice, simple equations. Okay, so MATLAB is doing all those calculations. I've got various other. If I put that back to ten, and run it again, I've got various other graphs that it's plotted at the same time. Okay, here I've got distance versus time. Okay, so there's obviously it's going to do it in about eleven and a half miles. Okay, over about hundred seconds. So Andy Green, who's driving it, will go from zero to a thousand miles an hour and back to zero in about 100 seconds. Here we've got acceleration. OK, so you can see at the start of the run, it's just over 1G acceleration. OK, then at about 10 seconds, you fire the rocket, and suddenly there's a whole load of uh, more thrust. And you can see it goes up to about 2.5G of, of, you know, of, of you know, Andy being pushed back into the seat. That slowly reduces as the rocket's burning up, OK, and the speed... Um, You'll see the speed uh, at some point. No, it's that's from the other one. OK. And then he goes through the, mi mileage, um, through the measured mile and turns off the rocket and the jet engine. And suddenly the drag on the thing will suddenly have a big effect. And you can see it'll go from just, uh, just under 1G to minus 3G like that, OK, straight away. And so that's why we're using a... That's why Andy Green is doing it, because he's, you know, he's a jet fighter pilot. He knows how to deal with massive changes in G. OK, and then obviously the vehicle will be slowing down uh, due to drag, and as it slows down, the acceleration will reduce. And we've got, um, what's that? That's the same graph, but versus distance instead of time. And then this is going to be the drag. You can see as the speed increases, the drag um, increases, which makes sense. But you can see that this is not linear. OK, and that's because of what happens as you approach um, the speed of sound. Drag doesn't increase linearly um, like that. OK, that's versus time. 
So this, is, this just gives you a demo of the power of MATLAB. Okay, all those calculations are done in the blink of an eye. Okay, and there's lots of very complicated calculations going on in there. So there we go. So that's sort of a little demo of what MATLAB can do. I'm just going to set this back up to the way you, you'll see it before. Okay, so this is essentially MATLAB. There's four main screens that you can see. We've got this, this one here is the command window. I don't know whether this is. Yeah. So this is the command window, and this is where you enter various commands. Okay, you, you can type things in here. We have here the, the current folder. So this is the, the folder on your computer where you're currently located. On MATLAB, you, know, you can refer to other files, and if they're in that folder, it can see them. Okay. Here we've got something known as the workspace. And this is where the, you can store things called variables, and we'll cover them, what they are later on. Okay? And then down here, I've got a history of the different commands. You can see that the command I just ran to clear that screen is CLC. Okay? And that's cleared that screen. That was the last command I ran. To run that mission profiles thing, I can double-click on the command in the command window, and it will run that command again. Okay? So again, I get my graphs back. Okay, and you can see um, earlier... A few days ago, I ran this one called Magic 4. Okay, so that, these, all these different commands do various things. Now I'm going to type clear, or run the clear command. That gets rid of all my variables. Okay, and I'm going to clear the screen again, so we may as well run that CLC command. Okay, so that's basically, when you boot up MATLAB, this is what you're going to be presented with. So that's the MATLAB environment. If you want to get help in MATLAB with a particular command or, or how to do something, um, unlike quite a few software, um, the help system in MATLAB is superb. Okay? It really is a very, very good resource. You get to it by clicking on that little blue question mark and you get the help system. And in MATLAB, you can, you can either drill down by browsing through you know, whatever functions, uh, mathematics, and you can, you can see the various different you know, elementary math. So you can see that you can perform cosine or anti-cosine, okay, or arc cosine. These sort of, you know, so there's a whole bunch of commands in it. If you click on it, it gives you a little description of the command that you're going to get, okay, and some examples and various little things like that. So that's one way of getting help. The other way, let's say we want to look up the same command, you just type help and the name of the command. Okay, and it gives you a little short description of what that command does, and you can click doc and you get back to that same help page. Okay? So that's really good ways of getting help. Okay, so like I said, you, one way to um, look at MATLAB is to consider it as just a giant, very powerful calculator. Okay? So you can do basic arithmetic. And so I've got a few examples here. 2 plus 3 times 4 gives me 14. Okay? Notice that it follows the order of operations. Okay? I don't know what you've called it, whether you call that BOMDAS or PEMDAS or whatever. Um, it does 3 times 4, which gives us 12, then adds 2 to it. Okay? And obviously you can use brackets if you want to, to restrict it to doing a certain way. And obviously 2 plus 3 gives us 5 times by 4 gives us 20. Okay? <coughs> so you can use it as a big calculator. You can use it to do trigonometry. I can type sine. What have I got in here? Sine of pi by 6. Pi by 6, we know is 30 degrees, so that should give us a half, and it does. Notice that I've entered stuff in radians, okay? MATLAB works in radians, so if you've got something in degrees, you can use the calculator facility to convert it to radians, and then um, you can use sine, okay? Or cosine and tangent as well. Um, pi is a defined variable in MATLAB that will give you pi. If I just type pi on its own, comes out as 3.1416, okay? Notice that all the answers so far have been, well, all the decimal answers have been giving us only four decimal digits, okay? That's merely because MATLAB just wants to keep things tidy. It actually works to about 15 decimal digits, okay? So, um, but I'll show you how you can see them in a, in a minute. So, yeah, you can use cosine, tangent, um, sine to the minus one, tangent to the minus one, and cosine to the minus one. Obviously, they're just basic, simple commands. The carrot, which is shift 6, okay, looks like that. That's the carrot symbol. Is to the power of, okay, so 2 to the power of 16 gives me 60, 
65,536. Okay? Um, and you can obviously do more complicated ones. Minus 3, 2 to the power of minus 3 gives us 0 0.1250. Okay? You can also write the other way. To get a square root, you type SQRT. This is known as a function in MATLAB. Whenever you've got a function, it's something in letters. You open the bracket, and then you enter whatever it is you're operating on, and then you close the bracket. And if I hit return, square root 64, we're in as 8. What about cube roots and things like that? Well, there's another function called nth root. Let's, wait, let's create the cube root of 8. So I enter 8 here. Notice that MATLAB has given me a little hint about how I enter a command. So x, let's make x equals 8. And I want the cube root, so I've got it, well, cube is 3, and it just so happens that the second argument that this function takes is 3, and that gives me the cube root of 8. Okay, so these, you can, like I said, you can look in the notes. I'm just going through what's in the notes to find out more about it. But basically, functions are a, a bunch of letters where you open brackets and you stick in a number. If you've got two things that it takes, like here, I wanted the cube root, hence the 3 of 8, okay? You enter those things separated by a comma. If I wanted the, the fourth root of 8 or something, I could do the same thing, and I just change that to 4, okay? And so 1.6818 to the power of 4 will give me 8. And we all know our favourite variable e is written with exp, okay? So e to the power of 1, 1 gives us 2.787183, that's e, okay? And obviously you can put something else in. You can do logarithms. Logarithm of e to the power of 3 should give me 3, it does, yeah? Okay? Notice that this is called log, but it's actually performing a natural logarithm on your calculator, that will be ln. If you want log to the base 10, which on your calculator is, is log, you have to do log 10. Okay? This, like I said, all these things are in the notes for you to perform. Okay? Now, like I said, MATLAB works with three, four decimal places, you can see at the moment. But actually, it's working a lot more precision than that. You can show them by using the format command. If I type format long, okay, that changes the way MATLAB works. And if I type in pi now, you can see this is, this is the precision that MATLAB works to, okay? So it's a lot more fine than it appears when you first look at it. If you want to work in engineering notation or scientific notation, if you type in format long e, you'll get something to the times 10 to the power of, hence the e there, okay? It's up to you. I'm just going to go back to the standard notation, whoops, format short, Okay, and that gives me, that's gone back to the normal version. So, that's basic arithmetic in MATLAB. You'll notice that as I've been doing these things, I've been getting this thing called answer, and then obviously the number that's showing up. And I've got this thing in here called answer, and then the, the value of that, 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 that thing called ants. Okay, and that works a bit like the ants button on your calculator. Many of you will have a calculator and it's got an answer button, so you can use the previous solution. Okay, well, MATLAB does the same thing. I could do answer times 2, and I get 2 times pi, okay? But the thing is you, that you can assign in MATLAB other things other than answer to add to your variable library. So I could say x equals 2, okay? And now I've got a new variable up there called x, which equals 2. Okay, and I can say y equals 3. Okay, so I've got two variables, x and y, and I can do x times y, and it gives me an answer of 6. Now, if I wanted to assign 6 to a variable, I could say z equals x times y. Okay, so now I've got another variable called z that equals 6. Okay, so that's how you, you assign variables. You say something equals and then you work out what it is, okay? If you did that the other way around, if I tried to say a, sorry, x minus y equals a, I get an error, because it's not the right way around. If I said a equals x minus y, I would get the right answer, okay? So it needs to be that way around. 
There's a few rules about variable names, okay? Um, they can be any number of letters that you want, so average value equals x plus y, oops, no, let's get x plus y divided by 2, 2 and a half, which makes sense, okay? And, and so I've got a new variable called average value up there that I've defined myself. I could make a new one, average value 2, and let's go, let's call that x plus z divided by 2, and I get 4. Okay, so you can define variables as you want. Obviously, you can't use things like the minus sign in a variable because it doesn't understand you. Okay, and you can't start a variable with a number. Again, it doesn't understand you. Okay. Now, one thing that I've been doing that's, I suppose, not good practice um, is that if you want to do something in MATLAB, but you want to suppress the output, and often there are things to do in MATLAB that um, you do want to suppress the output, I can assure you, you do the same thing. You write the command, x plus y, okay, and you put a semicolon at the end. Now what, if I, let's define a variable, I'll call it s equals x plus y, okay. I'm going to suppress the output by using a semicolon. Now it's performed that command because I've got a new variable up there called s, which has a value of 9, okay. But, it, but, but, but notice that I haven't got a s equals 9 thing that's come out, okay. And that's because I've suppressed the output by using the semicolon. It is quite important that you do that, otherwise your commands, your things that you make, your programs that you make and the commands you run will just produce a whole load of gibberish on the, on the screen that's really difficult to decipher, okay? There are times when it's useful to see the output and there are times when it's not, okay? If I wanted to see the output, I could just type S and it shows me the output. Now, like, a, like you saw up here, I can use variables in calculations. Okay, but I've got a little example up here. Let's work out the area, sorry, the volume of a um, cylinder of radius two, two and a half and a height of, what have I used? I don't know, four, let's say four. And we know the area is going to be, well, the cross-section area, I'll call it cross, is 2.5 squared times by pi. Okay, pi r squared. So that gives me the cross-section area. And if I take the cross times by the height, I'll rename that volume. That gives me the volume of the cylinder. Okay? So I've got so I've used, I've defined these two variables as two and a half and five. I've worked out the cross based on oh I should have just used radius in there, but you know you can see I just did that anyway. And the volume is the cross-section area times by the height gives me the volume. Okay? So you just you just Define things as you think they should be defined, really, and you can use them over and over again. If I wanted to change, let's, let me say I wanted to change the height, okay? Um, I can just press the up arrow, and you can see it scrolls through the different commands, okay? So I'm going to change the height to 5, okay? And let's work out the new thing. If I press V, it'll go straight to the first command that starts with V. If I went to S, it would go there, C it would go there. But I'm going to press V, then the up arrow, whoops, and you can see it goes straight to the volume command, how it returns, there's my new volume, okay? So again, repetitive tasks, it's really good at doing those sort of things, and very quick to access them. So like I said, so I wanted to go back up to that average value, I can just press A and then the up arrow and it'll go straight to that, okay? So that's how you work with variables in MATLAB. And you can see we've now filled up the variable window in MATLAB with all the things that we've been defining. Okay? And obviously, all, you, all these commands are the ones I've been running to get those variables. If I want to clear out the variables, say I want to start something new, I want a bunch of new variables, type clear. Makes sense. All the variables are gone. Okay? If I type S, undefined variable. Okay? So it doesn't, it's forgotten what they are. I'm also going to clear the screen, so we've got a nice clean screen just to start afresh again. And it's always a good idea to do those sort of things. Now, MATLAB um, is short for matrix laboratory, okay? And that's because the underlying mass that MATLAB uses is matrix algebra, okay? Matrix mathematics, okay? Now, you will cover that in engineering math, but not until next semester. 
But don't worry, because you don't actually need to know matrix algebra to use MATLAB, OK? You can tell it to do what you want it to do, and you can understand what it should be doing, OK? But to help you along the way, to help you do the calculations, it's a good idea to get an idea of what a vector is, what a matrix is, and what an array is, because that's essentially how MATLAB thinks. But there are other words that we can use that you will be familiar with for vectors, matrices, array. Vectors, a vector, is simply a column of numbers or a row of numbers. So you're all familiar with Excel, yeah? A spreadsheet program. And if you've got a table of data, if you take one of those rows, the MATLAB thinks of that row as a vector, OK? And the same thing, if you just one column, it thinks of that as a vector as well. That's a column vector or a row vector. So think of it like that. And you can define a vector in MATLAB by using square brackets. OK, so I've got square brackets like that. And you just put the numbers in with a space between them. So that should create a row vector containing 1, 2, 3, and 4. So I've got a variable called a1. And inside that, I've got a vector of 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay? If I wanted to create a column vector, you can do the same thing. But instead of a space between them, if you put a semicolon between them, it creates like a line break. Whoops. And I get a column vector of 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay? So that's how you create columns. That's how you create row vectors. And if I wanted to, say, transpose A1, transpose means basically you swap the columns and the rows. It works with tables as well, but I'll show you that later. If you type A1 and then put a little quote mark, OK, it'll create a column vector of my row vector. So basically, it's changed the row into a column. And if I do that, I could do it back again. If I type on A1, with two of them, obviously it goes to a column and it goes back to a row, and I'll get a row vector back. Okay. That's called transposing. Like I said, you'll cover the details of that um, in engineering maths, but it's useful to know right here. There are other ways to define vectors. Okay, that's a, that's a simple way. If you know the numbers, you just bring the numbers in and with a space between them. But there are other things. There's something called colon notation. So if I Again, using square brackets, but this time, I, in fact, I don't need to use square brackets. I can just do that. If I just do that, 2 colon 5, colon understands it is, is, wants a range of numbers, and since there's no increment in here, it's going to create a vector with 2, 3, 4, and 5. It just uses integers. It assumes you want integers, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay? But you can control that increment. I've got an example in here. 2, 0 0.5, 4. OK, now I've got what this is going to do is going to create a row vector. It starts at 2, so like that one. It's going to add 0.5 to 2, so you're going to get 2.5 as the second thing. Add 0.5 to that previous value, you get 3, and so on, all the way up to 4. So if I press return, I've got another vector here 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5, and 4. These are just basically ways of defining rows of data. There's another, another way. It's called linspace. So if I type E equals linspace, this is a command. It takes three arguments, OK? This A says A, B, and N. Well, A is the starting value. B is the ending value. And N is the number of data points. OK, so say I wanted to create this vector, that row of values with this command. A is 2, B would be 4, OK, and I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so N would be 5, and I'll do that. So we do 2, 4, 5, I get the same thing, OK? So these way, the, you know, that A1 command is one way to define a row vector. This is another way if you want integer spacing between the values. If you don't want integer spacing between the values, you use two colons and you put the increment in the middle. Or if you know the number of values you want, OK, but you don't know what the increment is, you enter your starting value, the end value, and the number of values you want. And so you get that sort of thing. Let's say I wanted to do a similar vector f. Oh, no, I'll call it e. Let's redefine e. Let's say I wanted, I don't know, 50 values. And I'm going to suppress the output because 50 values, well, I'll show you what 50 values does. It does that, OK? 
but it's quite nice to suppress the value. So I've still defined it. There it is. OK, you can see it's a 1 by 50 row. Another feature of the variable thing is you can double click on it. Oops. Yeah, and you get a like a spreadsheet type editor. So you can see in the spreadsheet, it's just a row of data. OK, you can see the parallel between this and Excel. That looks like Excel, yeah? But that's, that's the variable E, OK? Like I said, it's quite important to suppress your data. Let's say we define H as a, num as a bunch of or integers between 0 and 100. You can type it. MATLAB does it pretty quickly, OK? And I get 100 values, but it looks like a mess, OK? Now, what about if cell is defining a range? OK, that. That's going to create quite a few values. And if I hit return, to display all those on the screen would take quite a, lot of quite a lot of time. The computer's working quite hard to keep up with the processing, OK? But if I do it with a colon, it's done, OK? And notice that I've got, uh, what have I got? 100 million values in that, in that variable, OK? And to display all 100 million values would take quite a long time. On my computer at my desk, it did it in 42 seconds, OK? Whereas if doing it with the colon took all of 0 0.064 seconds. So it's quite important when you're defining a big range to use the um, semicolon at the end. So that's vectors. Think of it as a row in a, in a spreadsheet or a column in a spreadsheet. If you know what vectors are, you can work out what matrices are. Matrices is the next step up. Think of it as a table in a spreadsheet. So a, you know, a grid of numbers, OK, with both columns and rows. And to do that, to define a vector, sorry, a, a matrix, again, you can do it the same way. You can enter numbers with a space. Well, that creates the first row. A semicolon, if you remember, creates a line break. And you can do the next row. Semicolon. And then the last row. And that will create a 3 by 3 matrix, OK, or table. So I've got rows, I've got columns, OK, and it's two dimensions because I've got three by three, three rows multiplied by three columns. Do you remember that transpose thing I was talking about where it swaps the rows and columns around, OK? Well, you can do that with a matrix. It'll basically take whatever's in each of these values and put them there, OK? Obviously, the diagonal is the same. It'll swap those two values around as well, OK? So I could type A, quote mark, and I get the same thing, but it's transpose. Now, here it's 1, 2, 3 across the rows, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Here I'm now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. OK, so that's the transpose function working. And you can, we covered a whole bunch of ways of defining rows. Well, you can do the same thing with a matrix. OK, so I'm going to use the kernel notation here. Let's go from 0 with an increment of 0.5 to 1. OK, semicolon to break the line. OK, for 0 0.5 to 5. OK, so there's a little 2 by 3 matrix, two rows by three columns. And I've used the colon notation, so that's the stuff for the first row, 0, um, 0.5 and 1. And this is the stuff for the second row. OK, so that's how you create matrices using the colon notation. And you can use linspace. And you can use a single colon if you want integer spacing the same way, OK, exactly the same way. There are a couple of special functions. If you want a matrix of ones, OK, whoops, I need to enter rows and columns. And I need to enter the right command, OK, there's a matrix of ones, OK, and the same, you could do zeros. And I get a matrix of zeros. They might be useful, depends on what you're doing. And arrays are the next step up in MATLAB, OK? Arrays, essentially, are multiple matrices on top of each other. So you can think of it as like a three-dimensional block of numbers. But MATLAB can go one step further. It can actually do multi-dimensional arrays beyond three dimensions. And that's quite hard to visualize, OK? But it shows you what some of the power that MATLAB can do. I won't cover arrays. It's not necessary for this module or this part of this module. OK, so we've covered the arithmetic, the basic arithmetic when you're just dealing with numbers. We've covered variables, how to define variables. 
we covered vectors and matrices as well. Okay, so you've got a pretty good understanding, well, you should have a pretty good understanding of, of sort of how to enter data into MATLAB. What about manipulating data? Now, we're talking here about mathematically manipulating vectors and arrays instead of just numbers. Okay, if I take, I take my um, A matrix up there, if I just type A, you'll see it again, and say I wanted to multiply it by B, which is a, which is a let's say B is the transpose of A, so I can define B here, B equals A. So I wanted to multiply them together. Well, how do I multiply them together? Do I do 1 times 1, 2 times 4, 3 times 7? Or do I do something else? Well, like I said, you'll be covering this later, but if I do A times B, I get a value. And notice that that isn't 1 times 1, 2 times 4, 3 times 7, is it? It's something completely different. That's because it's doing what's known as matrix multiplication. Now, you don't need to worry about that here, OK? Um, again, you'll be covering it in the second semester. But let's say we did want to do 1 times 1, 2 times 4, and 3 times 7, OK? Well, you have to do what's known as dot notation. Notice I've put a full stop before the multiplication command. And what that full stop says is that when MATLAB does the calculation, it does what's known as element by element multiplication. <laughs> so it takes the first element, multiplies them together. It takes the second element, multiplies them together. It takes the third element, multiplies them, and so on, with all those values. And so if I do those things, we get what we want. 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 4 is 8. 3 times 7 is 21. 4 times 8, sorry, uh, what is it? 4 times 2 is 8, and so on. OK, and you get, and obviously, the last value, 9 times 9 is 81. OK, so that's what we want. So don't forget the dot. It's very important. You can, to say if you, you're sort of thinking about whether you need the dot, you can still do the same thing. Whoops. You can still do the same thing with numbers, OK? It still gives you the same thing. So in some ways, it's wise just to always use the dot when you're sure you want element by element. And like I said, at the moment, that is what you want, OK? You don't need to worry about matrix multiplication. The same applies to multiplication, division, and um, if you've got something to the power of. So let's say I want a to the power of 2. So I want to square every value, OK? Again, if I do that, you get something completely different. But if you do the dot, you get, obviously, 1 squared is 2, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared, and so on. OK, so you get that's what you want. And the same with division. Say I wanted to do A divided by B. Notice that I actually get an error in MATLAB if I do that. But if I put the dot in there, I get 1 divided by 1, which is 1, OK? And then what, what is, uh, I can't really see, remember what A is now. And B, I think that was 4, so 2 divided by 4 is a half, and so on, you get those values, OK? So, so that's how you do that. So don't forget the dot. It's very important when you're doing, dealing with matrices that you remember the dot. And like I said, it doesn't matter whether you've got scalars or matrices, numbers or very, you know, big tables of data um, when you're doing those calculations. So you may as well use the dot value, OK? The dot times dot divided dot um, to the power of. What about I've got a big table of data and I want to pick up a certain value? OK. Well, there's ways to index matrices. I'm going to just clear the screen just to clear things up. I'm going to make a matrix, a 4 by 4 matrix. Now, magic is a nice little command. OK. I'll let you work out what magic does, but it's, you know, you, can, you might have come across it before. And uh, so I've got a 4 by 4 matrix, and let's say I want to pick off a value, OK? Well, you can type, and I'll define, I'll define the variable, actually. D equals magic 4. OK, so there we go. I've got D equaling that, that matrix. Let's say I want to pick up a value. Well, you type D, open brackets, and then you type the index of where that, where that value is. So let's say I wanted to pick off that 10. Well, we know it's in the second row and in the third column. So I type the second row. Comma, third column, it gives me 10. OK? What about if I wanted the whole row? Well, let's, let's say we want the third row. Well, I type D. OK? I want the third row, so I type in 3. 
But I want all the values in the column. Now, to do that, in MATLAB, you type a colon. And notice it's picked out the whole row, OK? The colon indicates that it wants all those values. If I went to the third column, I can do the same thing. Notice I use the up arrow to get the previous command. Colon, three. OK, so third column, so it's the second thing. I've got the third column. And you can, do, you can be even more complicated. Let's say I want, I don't know, the third and second values, sorry, the th third and fourth values of the fourth column. Well, OK, I can type in D. No, sorry, fourth, let's, let's go for the fourth row, OK? And I want the, let's go for the second, third and fourth. Well, I can type in 2, colon 3, oh, sorry, 2, colon 4. And we know that 2, colon 4 is 2, 3 and 4, isn't it? OK? So you can type that, and notice I've picked off 14, 15, and 1, OK, using that command. Now, there's some exercises that will get you to work with indexing um, variables as well, OK? So there's, like I said, a lot of the details are in the notes. In the workshops, it's a good idea to go through the notes, as I've done here, perhaps in your own time. The workshops are one hour long, but you can have a go at doing them, OK, and you can get some help. Now, the last thing I want to cover is saving data, because it's vital, OK? If you're working on a problem and you've, you know, you've, you've, you've created a whole bunch of variables that you want to retain, but say it's the end of the class and you want to come back to them at the end, OK? Well, there's ways of saving where you are, OK? If you just close MATLAB and boost it back up again, they're, they're gone, OK? You can't get them back unless you run all those commands again. But let's say we wanted to save those variables that I've defined there. Well, it's quite easy. There's a couple of ways you can save. Type save and then the file name. So I'm going to call it my files. And notice it's in my workspace it's created this thing called a, a mat file called my files. OK, and so if I clear the data, all gone, back to the start. But I've just come back into the classroom. I want to start back working on my files. Well, to get them back, you type load my files. And suddenly all my variables are back. OK. So it's quite a good idea to save data. You can use save and load. Or if you're more used to sort of the Windows interface, you can click on save. And you get the sort of same sort of thing, my files too, etc. OK, so I've saved it. If I clear, oops, let's clear the data. And if I wanted to load it, I can click on, is that one? Import data, my files too, open, and you can load up the data. It sort of asks you how you want to load it. Do you want to load them all? Yes. Let's just click finish. And there we go. OK. MATLAB can export to things like Excel and Comres separated files and all those sort of other formats. I won't go into the details here because you don't really need to know that just yet. But it might be useful when you get round to doing like project work and stuff in this if you want to use Excel for something. OK, so that's the end of the first session. At the, at the end of the chapter, I've got a bunch of commands listing the various things that I've used in this session. Okay, So if you want to refer to, you know, get an idea of what I've used, you can look at the back. If you want help on those commands, type help and then the command name. Okay, So you can look up in the help system on MATLAB. Okay?